Hello everyone, my name is Denise. I'm a Catholic counselor. So recently, one of my friends, Charmaine, uh, told me that she actually watches this channel and she particularly enjoys my book reviews. So I went back to the YouTube channel and filtered by popularity. I realized that my book reviews actually get the most views. So for, for Charmaine and maybe for my vain glorious attempt to get more views, I might start doing more book reviews. So I'm going to start with this book that I've been uh, reading, uh, although quite slowly, like right now, I think I'm only almost one third way through. Yeah. But but this book is, is, is really good and I want to maybe do a few parts. So let's just do part one today, okay? Life at the Bottom by Dr. Theodore Derrimple. Probably pronounced wrongly. But just uh, this is the title if you want to buy this book. So he's a psychiatrist uh, who works at the prison as well as uh, at the, the British slum, okay? Near the, the prison and at the psychiatric hospital beside the prison. So all day... All, in and out, he deals with what he called uh, the underclass of, of his British society. So he's got, like I would say, thousands and thousands of hours listening uh, to patients. So maybe he doesn't have a PhD, but the amount of experience he has, right, that is encapsulated in this book, I guess it's, it's even better than a PhD, okay? Maybe he can have an honorary PhD. And especially in areas uh, like personality disorder, antisocial personality disorder, because, you know, uh, one of his expertise is the uh, the prison image, right? So if you really want to learn a bit about ASPD, to know more about their pathology, I guess this is a great place to start. And also, uh, this Dr. Theodore tends to write in a very whimsical, almost poetic way, and sometimes very ironic, hilarious way of writing. So it's not like trudging through uh, paper after paper, scientifically published paper, to understand about ASPD, you're actually really just uh, listening to a story or some of his accounts or he's filtered through his own ironic, whimsical way of talking, of writing. So it's quite pleasurable. Okay, so okay, that's enough of an introduction. Uh, let me just start with the first chapter. The knife went in. Okay, so um, let me let him do the talking, alright? <clears throat> Page 5. Listening as I do every day to the accounts people give in their lives, I'm struck by the very small part in them which they ascribe to their own efforts, choices and actions. Implicitly, they disagree with Bacon's famous dictum that chiefly the mould of a man's fortune is his, in his own hands. Instead, they experience themselves as party in the hands of fate. It is instructive to listen to the language they use to describe their own lives. The language of prisoners in particular teach, teaches much about the dishonest fatalism in which people seek to explain themselves to others, especially when those others are in position to help them in any way. As a doctor who sees patients in the prison once or twice a week, I'm fascinated by prisoners' use of the passive mood and other modes of speech that are supposed to indicate their helplessness. They describe themselves as marionettes of happenstance. So, okay, I'm skipping one paragraph to the next paragraph. This is page 6, really. Yeah? Yes, he said, it's just my luck to be here on this charge. Luck? He had already served a dozen prison sentences, many of them for violence, and on the night in question had carried a knife with him, which he must have known from experience that he was inclined to use. But it was the victim of the stabbing who was the real author of the, ki the killer's action. If he hadn't been there, he wouldn't have been stabbed. Okay, so in this case, Dr. Theodore Derrimpole was trying to illustrate the point of the use of language to um, and you know, yes, I'm about to evangelize choice theory, reality therapy again. I'm not ashamed of that. Okay. As you know, CTRT emphasizes a lot on the use of language. We are not depressed. We are depressing. We are not anxious. We are anxietying. We are not under stress. We are stressing. So it, it, it um, uh, what's that? Uh, the use of language to change a, uh, possible noun or state into a verb like stress to stressing right is used to empower the person who is speaking that language so that the person can make a change which is the direct opposite of what's happening here 
Remember, the title of this chapter is The Knife Went In, which is actually something the doctor actually heard when he's interviewing some of his clients. So instead of taking personal responsibility and making uh, changes in the areas that are within their control, they tend to ascribe it all entirely to fate, okay? which is bad because it keeps the patient stuck in whatever situation he's in, whether it is uh, what's that, multiple recidivism or domestic violence, either the perpetrator or the victim of it. And remember, one of the interesting points he put is, is especially pronounced uh, in cases when these patients are talking to the psychiatrist, maybe the counsellor. This this uh, passive stance, like uh, it just happened and I'm a, a victim of fate. He, it's quite interesting because he said that when these patients would go back and talk to the other inmates, right, they, their language shifts and they actually start to share tips on how to game the system. <laughs> or like, oh, you say this, right? Then the doctor will give you more medicine. If you say this, they will, uh, they will give you more subsidies for this if you ask for it later. So you see, when there's an advantage to talking in this way, people tend to talk this way. And, and a lot of it, I sense, is, is, a, is a form of laziness. They don't want to take responsibility of their lives. And uh, they want to just let other people rescue them. Like um, later on on this first chapter, he will, he will talk about how some of the patients... Well, we'll say that, doctor, I, I just keep stealing cars, I can't control myself, can you please cure me, can you please cure me? Has it anything to do with um, <laughs> the trauma of my childhood? The doctor's reply was, was fantastic, he said, nah, it's nothing to do with your childhood, mostly because you're an asshole, would want to respect the rules and want the short way out to, to get a lot of money, so that's why exactly you did it. And of course that elicited some laugh from the patient. And afterwards, they did talk about the trauma of the childhood, which of course probably had some impact. Although it is really always very unhealthy to ascribe an entire responsibility to your childhood, which happens to be an axiom of CTRT as well. You see how I slipped it in there? Okay, come let's go on to the next chapter, chapter 2 on page 17. <laughs> it's a very interesting story, let me tell you. Huh? <clears throat> Talking about, I think uh, this is here is a... Uh, I think it's a young girl, seven, 13 or 14 But it's a girl in her teenage years Who is in the hospital for attempted suicide Can't exactly find the actual age Okay, So she's living with her mom, who's a single mom And uh, the rest I'm just going to let the doctor speak for himself Okay, She doesn't want to go to a municipal children's home either and in this, I can't entirely blame her. She says she wants to be found a foster family, but this social worker informs me that not only is this difficult to arrange in a hurry, but that once any prospective family knows about her history, her truancy from school, her bulimia, her risk cutting, uh, it will not agree to take her. The only possible solution would be for her to live with her aunt, her, sister's mother, uh, her mother's sister, uh, where she lived once before and was so happy that she behaved herself. But her mother, exercising parental rights, if not duties, has forbidden that. Precisely because, as I surmised, she behaves well there. Her mother wants to be rid of her as much as she wants to be rid of her mother. But her mother also wants to maintain the friction that this desire stems solely from her daughter's impossible conduct. In order to disguise her own contribution to the situation and her indifference towards her own offspring, it is imperative that no place be found for her daughter that she is so that is so agreeable that her behavior improves there. Okay, this is a beautiful example. Like uh, some mothers or even fathers want to so much to maintain this victim status. I'm a victim of a horrible child, of a totally disrespectful daughter. I'm a victim of that and, and I've been suffering under her thumb the thumb of my daughter and, and, and I want to maintain this victim status so much that I don't care if my daughter gets better or not in fact if she happens to behave better at my sister's place that's clear evidence that my sister is possibly a better mother than me and I don't want that in fact I want to feel like I'm the best mother I've tried everything and I want my daughter to continue to be an impossible case so that I can be a victim 
gain some kind of a pride from it and continue to be locked in this painful, ugly situation. You, you see that? So this is actually a real case. It's not a fake case. But it's also playing out in many different ways in even in the here and now in the counselling. For example, if uh, the... Uh, um, in in a family situation, family therapy, you realize that it is this child is actually behaving very well when she's with her teacher or with another attachment figure. Immediately, the mom might feel very threatened, like, "Who the hell is she? That she can control my daughter so well? Does this mean there's something wrong with my parenting style? Oh, God forbid." I, I'm perfect, I tried my best already, I really tried my best and, and I'm such a great human being, I'm so perfect. God forbid that someone can be better at me than me. So, so see, when pride comes in the way, right, it becomes very hard and, and it almost becomes an impediment. It, it is much better to realize that, oh gosh, you know, my sister seems to be dealing with my daughter better than me and she seems to be willing to take it on. Maybe I should just leave her, you know, at my sister's house for a while while, while I sort out my own mess. And then pick her up when I'm ready, and when I become a better mother. And uh, yeah, maybe I'll still visit her once a week, and try to do as little damage as I can in that time. But that takes humility, which is actually very hard. Okay, so so yes, that's this point. But it's also the same point as reiterated again. Same thing. This mother is taking the stance that she's a passive victim, victim of in this case her daughter's impossible rudeness and and misbehavior. Okay. So, um, one last point. My baby is crying, so I'll make one last point, then I'll end this video and attend to him. <clears throat> this one is the next chapter, page 38. Tough love. In my toxicology ward, for example, 98% of the 1,300 patients we see each year have attempted suicide by overdose. Just over half of them are men, at least 70% who have recently perpetrated some domestic violence. After stabbing, strangling or merely striking those who now appear in medical records as their partners, they take an overdose for at least one of three reasons, sometimes all three. Number one, to avoid a court appearance. Number two, to apply emotional blackmail to their victims. And number three, to present their own violence as a medical condition that is their duty, doctor's duty to cure. As for our women patients who have attempted suicide, some 70% have suffered domestic violence. So th this period of my life, I was quite down and out. So that was once I went to the IMH A&E. And over there, there's all the pamphlets of domestic violence. I kid you not. So only if you've been there, then you'll know this. So it is true that, that a lot of people have this suicide ideation after being victim of domestic violence and DV. DV, so to speak. And you see how, uh, in, instead of facing one's guilt or contribution to the problem, sometimes it's easier to just overdose. If you die, then you die. Okay, that's the end of the story, right? You don't have to pay the consequences anymore. If you don't die, there's still advantages to it. Number one, you can avoid a court appearance. Number two, you can apply bad meal to your victims. Right? Like, like, not only am I going to torture you by strangling you, after that, right, you also have to deal with the fear of losing me through suicide. It's like, how cruel can you get? So that's a very antisocial thing to do, uh, antisocial PD thing to do. And third one, to present their own violence as a medical condition that is the doctor's duty to care, okay, to cure. Similarly, same as the car thief, I told you, I can't stop <laughs> stealing cars. Doctor, please cure me. So see, I can't stop abusing my wife. Uh, doctor, please cure me. So it's the same kind of uh, of feigned helplessness. Okay. Which is not entirely wrong. I want to be a bit more compassionate with people diagnosed with ASPD. It's true that the prefrontal cortex is, has actually, I think, 11% less matter than the rest of the population without ASPD. So the ability to self-control is also truly a bit more impaired compared to the main population. But there are still things that can be done. For example, the case about the knife stabbing guy. He could just don't bring a knife or he could just not go to the place where his victim is if, he's, if he feels there's some rage starting to stir up that day. There are still things that can be done to prevent you from being in a situation or where it is quite easy to to give in to your temptations to violence or cruelty. Okay? Okay. So, 
that's all for today's first part of this uh, book review life at the bottom um, okay very rarely do I find a book so enjoyable but this book is really enjoyable and so it's packed with knowledge as well and um, I highly recommend it you, you can buy it from Amazon and uh, yeah do if you do read it and you do like it you can share your comments below and let me know so that we can grow in knowledge together okay so if you found this video helpful kindly press like share and subscribe thank you so much god bless